to the Alex Salmon Show and to the second part of a feature on the influence of Scots on the United States of America. Last week we looked at the contribution of the most famous Scots American of all, Andrew Carnegie. This week's programme gets right up to date with a report from this month's Tartan Day Parade in New York. Alex also meets with modern day Scots, including the lovely Howie Nicholsby of 21st Century Kilts and the fabulous Alan Lynn from the very famous Norwood Club, both making their mark on the artistic life of the Big Apple. But first, to your messages, your tweets and your emails. First, we hear from Eleanor, who says, Brilliant interview with Gino Francisconi. Looking forward to the rest. Well, Eleanor, he was a fabulous interview with a great passion for all things Carnegie. I certainly learned so much uh, from him. Then we hear from Arthur, who says, Another fascinating show and interview. Bravo. Here's a wee photo of my childhood library in Deniston. Only late in life did I learn it was there due to Andrew Carnegie. Scots of my generation were taught very little of our own national story. And Christopher responds by saying, used it also. My dad was the attendant there in his fine green uniform in the 1960s. What a lovely wee story. And finally from Hazel, who says, congratulations. Absolutely riveted by the interview in Carnegie, watching the recording in my pajamas instead of getting on with my day. Can't be the only Scottish child told, do you think I'm Carnegie? When asking my mum for something legendary. Thank you. Now back to New York, where we find Alex joining in the fun in Times Square. This is the Alex Salmon Show, celebrating Scotland Week in New York City! Yeah! The Tartan Day Parade, which takes place the nearest Saturday to the 6th of April, is one of the highlights of Scotland Week. Since its inception 20 years ago, celebratory events have spread throughout the United States and Canada. However, New York still commands the most colourful displays. Here they place a premium on big and brash. Most of the tartans on display at the parade are of a traditional variety. There are modern Scottish designers who see kilts as a cool choice of wear, not just for a Sunday best. Foremost among them is Howie Nicholsby, himself a former Grand Marshal of the Tartan Parade, whose kilts have been worn by Robbie Williams, Alan Cumming and Vin Diesel. In Howie's words, he makes kilts for the 21st century. Howie, for, for 20 years and more now, you've been pioneering the radical evolution of tartan and the kilt. Tell us what that's about. I'm trying to make the kilt back to what it originally was, everyday clothing. Before the English banned it in 1745 after the Jacobite Rebellion, and it was seen as, oh, if you wear a kilt, you're a rebel and you hate this and you hate that. I want to make the kilt back to what it really was, everyday clothing. At the parade this week, I mean, how many people are going to say, I'm going to go back with Howie to get to the original kilt? Well, see, I'm seen as a bit of a rebel, a bit of a maverick. So am I. That's why we get on so well, Alex. So I'm wearing grey denim. And what do most people wear every day? Jeans. So why can a kilt not be denim? Tartan, I'm not saying it's totally made up, like checks and tartans and patterns. Samurai warriors, Maasai warriors in Africa, patterns and checks are throughout the whole world and it's actually an early form of camouflage. Kilts don't have to be family or tartan. It's called unbifurcation. Say that word again. Unbifurcated. Good, I'll just check it. Crotchless. And actually, it has been medically proven that Scottish men are less likely to get testicular cancer and impotency because they wear a kilt, because they get more airflow. So if you wear a kilt, you're more potent. Yes. You want a PGI to make sure that kilts have to be of a certain standard and have a geographical uh, origin and guarantee of quality. Why I love this man, very articulate, perfect. So what I'm wearing right now would not classify as a PGI traditional Scottish kilt. I'm wearing a denim, machine made kilt. The uh, denim's from India. So I want traditional Scottish craftsmanship Crafts womanship because I know very few male kilt makers. So when I walked down the Royal Mile, which is why I'm not on the Royal Mile anymore, and I left my mum and dad's business, I'm tucked away on Thistle Street. It drove me crazy, Alex. Like literally, really upsetting that someone could have the real McCoy kilt, 99 pounds. I can't buy the fabric for 99 pounds. So what you're saying is you want the same guarantee of authenticity for the kilt 
as, for example, Scotch whiskey has to have. Absolutely, because it drives me nuts that you can walk down the Royal Mile and see a kilt for £99 and people say, traditional kilt, real McCoy. I want three parameters to be able to call a kilt, a traditional Scotch kilt. Pure wool, made in Scotland, hand-stitched. That's what a real kilt is. Otherwise, the art form will die out. What do you mean, the art form will die out? Well, my kilt makers, it's one kilt maker, one kilt. But most kilts are made in factories. So that factory, the lady knows how to put straps on. The guy knows how to do the pleats. But no one person knows how to make a kilt. We're not kilt makers. A kilt maker is someone who sits with eight yards of fabrics, works out to your personal size, the fabric, the layout, how it's going to fit, and it's one person, one kilt. Eight to 12 hours amount of work, like properly. It's an art form. And it's just going more and more, just mass production, factory, and we're not fitting properly, they don't look good. They look crap. But amazing things have happened to Tartan. I mean, you know, back when I was a lad in the, in the 70s, if I turned up at the school dance in Tartan in a kilt, then I'd been taken to the toilets and beat up probably. And now if you go to a school dance or a wedding or a celebration, you know, everybody yeah, but will, Alex, have, a, Alex, will Alex, have a kilt Alex. on. So, I mean, there's been a transition of Tartan. It's now accepted as a... Well, my father was probably the leader of that. He was the first guy to do an outfit package that you could see what you were getting at a price. And he was the first guy to do rentals in the 80s. So he was like the first bastion of making the kilt again more for everybody. Yeah, reclaimed by the working reclaimed class. Reclaimed by the working class. Yes. And that's, OK, my kilts are expensive, but they're lifetime purchases. So if it's a lifetime purchase, I mean, could you get a, maybe a timeshare in one of your kilts? Well, you become part of my own tribe. So it is kind of a timeshare, but a kilt, like a jacket, and you buy a good jacket, you can pass it on to your children. So when I got this jacket, I said to my eight-year-old, you're going to get this jacket in 30 years. So my kilts, 100% are heirlooms. So Howie, I mean, your dad, as you say, helped to popularise the, the kilt, reclaim it for the working class. You're knocking on the evolution, another radical evolution of... Uh, of the kilt and tartan. So how far has this revolution still got to go? My dream would be, I want to be a brand that is for everyone, to make kilts for people every day who just walk into a shop, whether it be Moscow, New York, London, Paris, and they can buy a kilt. And they would know it was authentically Scottish? Yeah. Yeah, made in Scotland, designed in Scotland. If you don't have a, a kilt in your wardrobe, man or woman, then yeah. you're missing something important in life. Yeah, 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 I'd say it's definitely a beyond life choice, it's beyond fashion. A kilt is thousands of years old, whether it be the Egyptians or the Vikings that brought it to us. Every culture across the world has unbifurcated garments. So whether it be a sarong or a dashiki or African tribal wear, it's all crotchless. So in a phrase, the best days of the kilt are still to come. Oh, God, yeah. Absolutely, Alex. Howie, thank you very much indeed. No, oh, thank you. You're a legend, mate. Love you. From Carnegie Hall through Central Park, I'm on my way downtown to West 14th Street to meet a Paisley buddy, Alan Lynn, who's created a, an island for the curious in this sea of industry. Because if you're in New York's artistic community, then Norwood is the place to be. Alan Lynn, creator of Norwood, an oasis of conversation, conviviality, creativity in the middle of New York City. Where did you get this idea? I love the idea of creating a space that is for creative people, uh, obviously a home for the curious, and a big melting point of creative people from New York and around the world, we have different affiliates. But yeah, it's just my background's fine art. So it's to create a home for the curious. And people have to be curious because you can end up at dinner here with folk you don't know. You're stuck around the table and you better get on. There's nothing nicer than being thrown into a situation where it's about you sitting next to someone and having a conversation. It emphasises, obviously, human interchange, face-to-face. -face. Exactly. Are you some sort of 
antidote to the social media counter revolution? No, I think we can take both ends of the things. I think what I'm saying is we've got members from some of the biggest tech companies. They're members here because they want somewhere to come and sit and have a conversation with someone. Both have to be embraced. We cannot be naive about technology. But there is the other thing of that we don't isolate communication, personal communication with people. And that's why you need a physical space. You need a big sofa. You need to sit there and look at someone's eyes and say, I hate you, or I love <laughs> you, or whatever it is, or I'm falling in love with you. But right now, even like dating's all online, but you don't know, you, nobody knows the kismet of falling in love. The art, uh, artistic community in New York and much, much wider afield mm -hmm. rave about this place. Uh, but is it just a collection of artists? I don't mean just artists, but you know what I mean? Is it only... Is that no, really it's the... not just artists, because, I mean, I learned a lot when I was at the Royal College of Art and in the 80s and the Satchi brothers came in and bought art. You need to have commerce to be with art. You, it, you're naive if you don't. And I know so many great artists who are just not good at the financial side. It's not what they do. You need to have the people that know about money to make sure you can still carry on being an artist. The old days of the 19th century of living in a garret in France, lovely, but then they die. I mean, it's the whole thing is the people we admire, a lot of the time, like Van Gogh or different people, Sylvia Plath, tortured artists that we love, but they had a miserable time. You've got to accept both sides. But this is a, a very well adorned garret in New York. I mean, <laughs> I, I, even for a Philistine like myself, <laughs> I mean, I'm seeing some extraordinary... I mean, how much are the walls worth in this place? No idea. Because you've got some great artists Yeah, we do displaying. some great artists, but there's a piece right up there that I found in the street, and it is the same composition as a Francis Bacon painting, but it was on the street. So the whole thing is, who knows what is good art? Now, how... I mean... Even something as different and as original as this, you must have had some inspiration, another space, another club. You thought, I do like to do that in New York, and I'd like to do it better than special. No, it's my answer. It was folly. It was stupidity. I took a leap of faith and came to New York and just didn't know what I was doing. I had a house in Hackney. I sold it. I came across here. I went round the streets of New York raising money with a dream of building something unique to New York. Alan Lynn, Scots have a, a knack of blending in. Yes. Becoming part of the, the furniture, the infrastructure, whatever society they've gone to. Uh, obviously here in America. Well, I think they assimilate better. They don't feel part of... As well, saying that, as much as the clan situation, there is a whole thing in New York. There is those Presbyterians who came here and joined, and it's Hill and Hame, and it drives me crazy because I think we're much more creative than the homeland type thing. I think that we actually get out there. So whether it is the 80s pop musics of Simple Minds uh, or all these other people who traveled and made things happen. The guy who built the San Francisco cable car system, whether it's Carnegie, whether it is the guys who then built uh, Princeton University, they came and just did it. I think they didn't really think it's because they were Scottish. I think there is something in Scotland, though, that makes us a bit adventurous. Maybe it's the bad weather? I don't know, that we want to go away and go somewhere else. Well, the, the Reverend Witherspoon in Princeton was uh, right. agitating for a revolution. He, he, was right. a, he was a Republican in Scotland right. uh, and found it much easier to be a Republican in an incipient republic here in America. Hmm. But he, he, I mean, it's quite interesting, he came out from Scotland, not as a young man, as a you know, middle-aged man, and with a, with a view of uh, turning what when was a college for training Presbyterian ministers into a right. university mm -hmm. to train the leadership of a new republic. Yep. So he came out with an agenda. Did you have an agenda? Not really, but Angus, my dogs, actually, my husband went to Princeton and he, he's called Witherspoon at Princeton, oh, okay. but that's another thing. <laughs> Did I have an agenda? Uh, again, back to I think I said before, wanderlust of wanting to go somewhere that We've all got it in our roots of just somewhere that we want to go to. 
and nobody knows what that is. I had an aunt who lived in Dumbartonshire in a cottage up a hill, and when her husband dies, all she said was, I want to go to Petra. And we were like, really? She's going to Petra, I've always wanted to go, I don't know why. Sometimes there is that thing that you just want to go somewhere, not to run away. I mean, there is people who have been disenfranchised who have came to America, there's people who have been forced to come to America, like the slave trade, but a lot of people tend to follow the sun sometimes. If you look at immigration, we've emigrated, emigrated, emigrated all the way across. And the most Scots that came to America are in California. That's the highest level of Scottish people. So they must have been just kept looking, kept looking, kept looking, and they thought, oh, fine. So Norwich passed your 10th anniversary. 10th anniversary I mean, this year, you, thank you. you. When, when you started, it, did you say, we'll do, you know, we'll get 10 years in at least, or do you not think you'd get 10 days at that time? Uh, well, we opened just as the big financial thing hit us. And it was tough. It was really tough. Do you know what I mean, I didn't take a wage for a long time just to keep going. But I wasn't going to give up. Um, I just wanted to just keep going. Of course, like anything, years pass and all of a sudden it's your 10th anniversary and for our 10th anniversary we got the wonderful Alistair and Susie Nicholl to host some of the greatest Scottish painters in. So we've got Curry, we've got uh, John Byrne, we've got, uh, who else have we well, got? I've seen the Bellany. Bellany, John <laughs> Bellany, a lovely man. God rest his soul. There's a great piece upstairs we talked about, a moon where if you look at the moon on different continents, you're connected. So yeah, so we did that for her. But next year, it's all photography. We've already found someone who's a, uh, a photography gallery person who's doing that. Then the following year actually is the guy who painted this, who just did an exhibition with mice running underneath it, Joe Grazzi, and it's called Ingenue. So we're going to do cutting edge for that year. So it's not about being a, 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 a museum or a homage to Scotland. It was this year uh, slightly self-indulgent to do a Scottish exhibition, but we're international. Well, this is very much an internationalist club, and you've got all shapes and sizes, all nationalities come here. But I know you do your bit for Scotland Week. Mm -hmm. What sort of event has the, the club hosted in the past? And what did you think of... Uh, Katie Tunstall being the first woman Grand Marshal of the parade this year. What took them so long? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, right now it is. I mean, with all what's happening in the world and the Me Too and all that, it is like women are just rising. Mm. And I just applaud that. It's like they're taking over, and I'm quite happy with that. Um, with Scotland Week, we've done, we work a lot with the Scottish Government. I mean, this time last year, mm -hmm. uh, Nicola Sturgeon was over, she came here. The Royal Scottish Ballet did a performance in this room, just two people, right. and it was beautiful. Do you know what I mean? But we've done things with Ryan Burns, who's Gerard Burns, the famous painters. Been on the show. But there's so many great, Scot I mean, there's one, uh, there's uh, so many Scottish people that I, I would love to even push forward and let America see them. Do you know what I mean? Like, so whatever happens in Scotland Week, I just don't want Scotland Week again to be too retrospective. I want us to be forward and pushing sort of that creativity. And as we discussed before about how Scots tend to assimilate but sometimes they're a wee bit shy about their ability. They're very quiet about that. So and sometimes... The and a heart to create. Yes, exactly. This building itself is, right. is pretty special. I mean, the, even by New York standards, this is a quite uh, interesting Well, it's a landmark building. building is, is, is like, like we would have like English heritage, Scottish heritage. There's a plaque downstairs. It was built in 1845 to 47 by Andrew Norwood, this was the top end of the city. Our garden wall was farmland after that. Andrew Norwood built the house 30 foot wide, two houses next door. This area was also known as Little Spain and Lorca used to write in the restaurant next door, which is the oldest Spanish restaurant in New York, La Nacional. 
So it has 14th Street's the widest street in Manhattan. Every single subway line goes through here. Uh, Klein and Jackson Pollock lived across the road. The guy invented the age rib lived there. But at one end of the street was the Union, so, the U so that's why you have Union Square sort of thing. And then at the other end was the port, so that was where uh, all the prostitutes were. And then it became the transvestites in the 80s and then the leather bar. So it's got this, and I think cities should have that dark and light and shade because it makes them more exciting. So much now has been homogenized and pushed down and not risky. And we've all been to that late night bar somewhere where you knock on the door and you go in and it's magical. And it's a real brigadoon of an experience. One seven hundred. One seven hundred. But that's why we've got no name on the door. There's no signage. And people have to find us, so discover in your, in us. So in your 10 years, uh, yeah. I mean, can you look back to an event or a party or a, a Kaylee that went uh, excessive or, or some, something that turned out just to be wonderful and surprising? <laughs> I don't think I can say this online. There's been many. There's been many... Uh, so confidentiality is assured? Yes, uh, we don't never say who our members are, and we have Oscar-winning actors, and we've got major, major writers, but we don't, they're all the same. But uh, your members say they're members, because many of your members have told me they're members. Oh, <laughs> really? Well, I, sing, that's up to them. I never uh, asked them and, to. And sing the praises of the... Yeah. Sing but the that's the thing, is because they're, they're just, say like an actor, it's a job. They want to be able to come and sit and have a cup of coffee and not be pestered or have a drink and get drunk with their friends. Mm. They all are, to me, everyone's of the same ability. Do you know what I mean? So respect, and that even goes to my staff. My staff are ex-dancers and they're writers and musicians, and someday they might be these people's bosses, but they're part of my group, because I've been there serving people, uh, and I think it's very important that you respect the staff and we respect our members, but there's no hierarchy, there's no clicking of the fingers. Ten years of surprising mm. success, uh, very unique atmosphere. Uh, are you going to spread your wings, follow the sun, have Norwood in San Francisco? No, I mean, I spent a year and a half flying back and forward to Los Angeles recently and they really tried to court me to go there. When I got there, it was a bit. It was a bit like watching a foreign movie and reading the subtitles and looking at the movie and reading the subtitles. It didn't click for me. I think even like London and New York are more. I'm a walking person. I love passing people in the street. I didn't really get it. I'm not the healthiest person in the world. Do you know what I mean? Like so. Um, but even if I did, when I was asked, I wouldn't take Norwood to New York. I'd go to. Uh, not New York, to LA. I would go to LA and create a club for them. Not just homogenize and copy something and put it somewhere else, but go there and actually I found a wonderful building which was uh, Howard Hughes's office. And I said, can I get the roof? And they said, what do you mean? I said, because I wanted to build this palatial rooftop garden that people would go into. Not create something like this, which is a house. Give them that air and space and base it on almost like Japanese where you could open closed doors. It'd be, so that was it. But if you decide to, to build something else else, I mean, you're from Paisley, and of course Paisley, yeah. folk are Paisley, Paisley buddies. Paisley boy does good. <laughs> buddies <laughs> always says might not paper. be a bad name. I so, don't know. Like, We've, I mean, we, on one of our cocktails is the Jimmy, which we invented. And basically, because it's made with Hendrix. Hendrix, as you know, comes from Girvin. Mm -hmm. uh, and all the reps think, oh, if you ever want to go to Scotland, I'm going, I don't want to go to Girvin. I didn't want to go to Girvin when I lived in Paisley. I'd have been happy going to Nardini's <laughs> for an ice cream. But anyway, so it's Jimmy because Jimmy Hendrix and people in Scotland call themselves, hey, Jimmy. And it's pestle and mortared cucumber with Hendrix gin and a bit of simple syrup. Hendrix and that's has it. a female head distiller, one of the few dist Wonderful. Well, gin but distillery, right, obviously, yeah. but has a female head distiller. But now, I want you to, as we, uh, before we finish, I want you to scotch one rumour. The bunnet 
that is not compulsory for, for people visiting the club. No, it's not. I don't know. <laughs> when I was in Glasgow last week, everyone had a bonnet. And then I realised it's probably because we're all at that age where our hair's going, and so we can still grow these bits. It disguises and, and a it multitude disguises. of sins. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So, and I don't know why. I, I've got a wonderful photo of m my grandfather in the shipyards and every single one of them was bonnets. wearing a bonnet like this. And, and when the ship was launched, the bonnets went up in the air. Right, and exactly. I, I've always wondered how you ever got your bonnet back. Same at football matches. Somebody well, scored same as like graduation up. as well, yeah. those things. But yeah. The, tr the trick is to go in with a cheap one and come out with a dear one, if you can. Catch a dear one coming down. <laughs> <laughs> Dear as in dear or dear as in dear? Don't dear really is expensive. <laughs> now listen, there we go I with Scotland, we can play those I can't ones. give you another bonnet. Oh. But what I can give you is the Alex Salmon Quay for being I on the really Alex Salmon Show. I really appreciate that. Now you know the drill. So I don't we have to tell you, it's the same in Paisley, you stick, it, stick the whiskey in the quay and only your close friends. Thank you very much. Alan, thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Now Robert Burns, sitting here behind me in a plinth of Peterhead granite, was much impressed by the times of the decoration of our broth. Uh, sealed on the 6th of April 1320, it articulated not just Scotland's right to independence, but the idea that the community of the realm of Scotland should choose a king uh, designed to defend their rights. It was therefore the, the world's first expression of popular sovereignty, the idea of sovereignty of the people. And Burns said it instilled within him a, a Scottish patriotism which would boil along there to the floodgates of life shut in eternal rest. Now, some 20 years ago, American historians recognised the contribution and the connection between Scotland's declaration of a growth and America's declaration of independence centuries later. And George W. Bush, as president, in one of his better decisions, inaugurated the 6th of April as Tartan Day to celebrate that connection. And over the centuries, Scotland has contributed much to this republic. Scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs like Andrew Carnegie, artists like Alan Lynn. But perhaps the most significant thing of all was the concept, the democratic intellect, the idea, the government of, by and for the people shall not perish from the face of this earth. Coming up on next week's show, in Trump's America, the radical forces and the establishment have one thing in common. They are both unnerved by the Trump presidency. So is there going to be change in the air? Can there be a counter-revolution from the left? Or will the Washington establishment get back in the driver's seat? I speak to a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and one of Washington's key commentators. They have very different views over the state of politics in this republic.